following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. We are back, in case you're wondering, with George. George Case. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and it is my pleasure to introduce the man himself and his guest. George, introduce your guest, George Case. Thank you very much, Ralph. Yeah, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, to our podcast audience Dan Schlossberg. Uh, Dan has a varied career in uh, baseball and journalism, and I'm looking forward to you know exploring a few of those uh, items of his background uh, during our podcast. Dan, I really appreciate you being with us. And uh, you know, if you could just give our audience a little bit of a background on yourself, and then you and I will talk a little bit. But uh, you have had such a varied background in baseball and journalism. Uh, I'd just like to have you uh, explain to our audience a little bit about your background and how you really got into into baseball and journalism. And I think it'd be very, very interesting. So, Dan, please. Thank you, George. Uh, this is my 58th year as a baseball writer. Five zero. Started in 1969 when I graduated from Syracuse University. I've written 38 baseball books, including some autobiographies as a ghostwriter, as you know, Al Clark, Ron Bloomberg, and Michael Hamilton. And how I got into this, it's kind of interesting. When I was a freshman in Syracuse in 1966, January, I wanted to take the short line bus from Paramus, New Jersey, back to Syracuse. And the driver showed up and he said, Syracuse is closed. I thought he meant the city, I thought he meant the school, but he actually meant the city. And what was going on was there was a huge blizzard where they got about four feet of snow, and we were only able to get as far as Albany, where they had a bus station and train station, where a whole bunch of us slept on the floor for a couple of days, before they finally hooked up a train with some snow plows, got us through to Syracuse, and we had more snow plows and a caravan by bus to our dorms. And it was a real experience. There were no, no classes. The newspaper, the Syracuse Herald Journal, didn't even print. When it did print four days later, the headline was, four pages of comics to get you up to date. So I wrote about it, wrote about the whole thing for my hometown paper, the Passaic Herald News in New Jersey, sent it in, they published a story. In April, when I went for an interview for an intern's job, and remember, I'm only a college freshman here, the editor said, we got 150 applications, we're going to hire three interns. And he actually thanked me, and I was walking out the door, and he said, wait a second, how do I know your name? I said, I wrote about the Syracuse Blizzard, and you published it. He said, you showed initiative, you're hired. So look at it this way. My whole career is a snow job. Yeah, good for you. That's a great story. So, You know what, I I wanted to ask you, Dan, since you were with the AP, were you with the AP at the same time that that Hal Bach was? Hal is on on with us every, every week. Yes, I know Hal very well. He was in the New York Bureau. I was in the Newark Bureau. So we were okay. colleagues. Right. Well, now, the thing is, is what I, I'm, I'm curious also, and I just wanted to mention, I understand about the snowstorm in Syracuse. I was playing basketball at Rutgers, and I remember we went up to play Colgate, and we were stuck in a in a blizzard up in Hamilton, New York, for like three days. So I I completely understand the uh, you know the feeling, and and I wanted to congratulate you on your initiative because you know a lot of people would just say to heck with it, I'm just not going to go, but the fact is that you did, and that's how you got your start. That's that's really interesting. It was just a good break, actually turning a bad break into a good break. That's really what happened. Right. Now, I wanted to ask you a couple of things. One, number one, uh, you started with journalism, but did you play baseball at all? Or what was your you know, baseball background? How, how did you develop that interest in baseball? Oh, I just love things like baseball cards and flipping and trading. I did play some amateur ball, nothing organized, no high school ball or anything like that. And I just loved the game. I used to watch with my father. That, I remember watching the 1957 World Series with my dad with the sound turned off on the old black and white Zenith. And he would tell me what was going on, and that's what I remember first in baseball. Right. Well, that, that's it with baseball. I mean, uh, I, I think baseball lent itself tremendously well to, to radio. And I know them myself. I, I, when I was a kid growing up, I used to listen to my dad playing on the radio. And one time, 
down in Washington. I fell asleep uh, listening to the radio, and my dad came in after a ball game and, and gave me a kiss goodnight. He said I woke up, and I looked at him. He had had a bad game, and I said, Daddy, you really stunk tonight. So, I mean, that was <laughs> my uh, my memory of baseball was always on the radio. And then later, as as you're talking about, I know we always had a – uh, initially a 12-inch black and white in my neighborhood. Uh, probably we had the only television in the area, and every, all the kids would come over and watch Howdy Doody and all that stuff. But I was fortunate because we were living in the in the Trenton, New Jersey area, Bucks County and, and Trenton, and we were able to get all three New York channels and the, and the channels in Philadelphia. So I was really fortunate because we were able to watch uh, you know, baseball played at Yankee Stadium, Polo Grounds, Ebbets Field, as well as at at Shy Park. So, it, it was a great uh, situation for me as a kid growing up. And all the all the kids in our area really love baseball because they, uh, my friends, because they grew up watching, you know, baseball and like you're saying, and black and white TV. Uh, but that was part of what the game is. You know, today it's all the technical stuff and wide screens and cable and all that. But, but and and uh, when you and I were were young, it was uh, black and white on a small television. And I like what you said about radio because the radio announcers really had to hold your interest. On TV, the picture can hold your interest. Those announcers right. don't have to talk as much. The radio right. guys did, and some of them would paint pictures where you couldn't do anything else. I mean, you just had the game on, and you had to focus on what was going on. For example, there was a guy named Les Kiter who was on WINS in New York, and after the Giants moved from New York to San Francisco, he recreated San Francisco games for their New York audience, and he would do it, it would, you know, he, he just had sound effects, and he would imitate the sound of the bat, or turn the volume up for the crowd. It was just just great. He did a great job job recreating those games. And Milo Hamilton, that was one of the autobiographies that I co uh, wrote. He told me that he recreated some games too, including the game where Roger Maris hit a 61st home run. Yeah, that, that's amazing, Dan. Because uh, again, going back to my childhood with Washington, Arch McDonald, who you probably knew of. Uh, Arch uh, was a broadcaster one year, I think, for the Yankees, but he had been in Washington. And one of his, uh, you know, major contributions to baseball during that era was recreating games. And uh, you know, the the announcers really never traveled, as far as I know, with the team. So he had to be in his studio, and he'd do what you're talking about. They'd make a crack of something for the crack of the bat and the crowd noise, and and they come up with all kinds of sound effects. So. I've always maintained, you know, baseball really lent itself to radio. and You paint word pictures, and I, I totally agree with you. The fact is television, I, I think, loses something with baseball. I get tired of seeing guys, you know, spitting seeds and, and chewing tobacco and doing all the kind of stuff that they do, adjusting their gloves, all the close-ups. And, and that's what baseball on television has become, where in the old days, they would really talk about what was happening on the field and, and as I said, you know, painting word pictures and some of those great New York announcers, uh, you know, Red Barber and, and Mel Allen and, and, and those guys were, were such a pleasure to listen to, and I always enjoyed baseball on the radio. I did too, and I got to know Ernie Harwell quite well. In fact, I had him on some of the baseball cruises I did. What a gentleman, one of the nicest people I've ever met in or out of baseball. And he was a broadcaster for several teams, the New York Giants, Brooklyn Dodgers, Baltimore Orioles, and then a long time with Detroit Tigers. And Ernie did the television when Russ Hodges was doing radio in Bobby Thompson's game. So not that many people heard Ernie Harwell. Well, no, I'm, I'm sure they didn't. I mean, I can still, you know, hear, hear, hear Hodges, you know, the Giants win the pennant, the Giants win the pennant. I mean, that was an incredible uh, you know, a phrase that he came up with uh, on the spot, and he was so excited. You can hear the excitement in his voice. So, you know, I, I think, again, that, that's part of uh, baseball and, and uh, broadcast. And I happen to also know Ernie Hardwell, Hardwell because of the fact that he uh, was broadcasting the Tigers when my dad was playing for Washington. So, you know, I certainly know, you know, his name and, and a great reputation in, in baseball as an announcer. You also mentioned, you know, another guy, Les Kiter, and I don't know whether you knew it, but I remember watch, uh, hearing Les Kiter on, uh, on television. He used to broadcast Big Five games from Philadelphia, believe it or not, basketball games. 
And he also made a few appearances on Hawaii Five-0 after he moved out to Hawaii later in his life. <laughs> I, I wasn't aware of that. that. That's really interesting. Now, let me ask you something else. You, you talked about your cruises, and I read a little bit about your cruises. You had uh, one of my very good friends, fraternity brother of mine, very close. I've known him a long time, Jeff Torberg. And Jeff was on oh, yeah. one of your Great cruises. Guy. Well, we're all yeah. Jersey guys, and, so that helps. Yes, Jeff uh, was from Westfield, New Jersey, and he and I went to Rutgers together. We're in the same fraternity. I, I've known Jeff since we were 19 years old. So uh, I know he was with you on, on at least one of the cruises. Do you, do you still do those cruises, or, or is that something you, you uh, stopped doing? I haven't done it for a few years. That last one was in 2015, but I'd like to get back into it. Altogether, I've done about two dozen on all kinds of ships, from the QE2 to the American Queen Riverboat. And you would have baseball players as as what guests? I mean, they they would they would meet with the fans and that kind of thing. Is that is that what the cruise was all about? Yes. In fact, uh, there was one cruise on the American Queen Riverboat where I was actually on the top deck alone with Stan Musial trying to fly a kite. <laughs> Well, you've had some wonderful experiences there. I mean, you're talking about unusual, but I, I know that you also had, you know, Feller and, and I guess Jim Cott and some others. And, you know, Cott was with uh, the Twins in 68, pitching for the Twins. My dad was a coach for, for Minnesota, so, I, I, you know, I knew Jim. Jim. Matter of fact, Jim called my dad just a few weeks before my father passed away just to inquire as to, as to his health. So, you know, my dad was very touched by that. And, of course, with Feller, as you know, and I think you know, you've written a maybe an autobiography. But but Feller and my dad were teammates with the Indians in in '46. So I occasionally would run into Bob at, at various events uh, when I was with Saber, and I think you were with Saber at one time as well, weren't you? Yes, I've been a member since 1981. Oh, you're still a member. Okay, because yes. I was the executive director of Saber for for a couple of years, and and really enjoyed the experience. I was more of a of a baseball historian and, and what I liked about baseball rather than the stats part of it. But, you know, I really enjoyed my experience with Sabre. And, and if you've been there, you've been there through a lot of different uh, uh, eras of, of baseball working with Sabre. Uh, were you in one of the North Jersey chapters or, or were you just a, a you know, member? Of the, were you actively involved with your background? Well, North Jersey had a chapter for a while. And, Right. I was mostly affiliated with the New York chapter, with Evelyn Beckley, okay. chair of that. Evelyn, yeah, and, I, that's why I asked you, because Evelyn, Evelyn and I were very good friends. So, Yeah, I, I, she and I as well. And I really enjoyed Sabre, and I'm, I'm definitely in your corner as far as historian over stats. I think we would get more members, we would be a much more fun organization if we just we got away from the math a little bit and the analytics. I like baseball the old way. History lives. Yeah, you know, that's the way I was, uh, Dan, and maybe I was a fish out of water and I made some comments when I first joined Sabre, but, you know, I know the reputation, of course, for stats, but I, I recall I, I stood up at one of the meetings and I said, my goal is to try to make Sabre uh, more of a, you know, widely known organization. Ted Williams once called Sabre the best cup secret in baseball. I said, you know, I, I don't want to keep it a secret. I, I'd like to expand it. And and I brought in some people, and we talked about, you know, more of the history of the game. But, but Sabre, as you know, was so dominated by, by people with that, that statistic and analytic background <clears throat> that it was totally different. I remember going to a couple meetings, and I was just listening in awe to these guys. I mean, they could tell you the, the time and temperature of a game that was played on a certain day and the crowd and what they did. I mean, it was incredible, the knowledge that, that some of these people had. <laughs> Oh, yeah, even minor league baseball they knew. Right. Yeah, they used to have, I think, a minor league, or maybe they still do, a minor league uh, uh, chapter or whatever it was, a research organization. They would do that. They did. A, they still have, I think, and do a lot of work with the Negro Leagues, and uh, they do a tremendous job. And uh, I had been with them when they were located in Cleveland, and I was still working out of Pennsylvania. They originally wanted me to go to Cleveland. I, I said no, which I'm sort of glad I did, because later on, not too long after that, they moved to Arizona, and I think that's where their headquarters now. Yeah, they're in Phoenix now. And they've had some great right. executive directors, too, some better than others. Lloyd Johnson was actually executive director and president. He's the only one who's done both. 
Right, and, and I think he was a, a author too, didn't he? He, he? I have a couple of his books, I think. Yes, he wrote some books, and he was a super guy. I really liked him. He had a great sense of humor too. Right. Well, baseball, you know, as, as you know, I mean, it's a really a small world. There's a lot of people that you know, I know that you know from baseball, and I, I hear people all the time on Facebook. They'll ask me a question, and I'll say, "Oh, yeah, I knew so and so," and it, it's amazing. Now, along those lines, Dan, you, you, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your book uh, with Al Clark, and I'd like to know a little bit about how that all began because Al and I are very friendly. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Al and I were both from Trenton, New Jersey. His dad was a sports writer for the Trenton Times, and uh, Al was a kid growing up in, in the baseball and umpiring, and we talked uh, quite a bit about it. And I said, Al, how did you ever get really involved with umpiring? He said, well, I, I couldn't hit the curveball. So I decided to, to call balls and strikes behind the plate. But Al's a very interesting guy, and I'm just you know, curious as to how you really got hooked up with Al and, and talk a little bit about your book. Well, Marty Appel put us together. Marty knows both of us quite well and thought we'd be a good match because I have been a ghostwriter before for other people. And it worked. We, we got along really well. And I always say that Al is the brother I never had because we get along beautifully. We have a lot in common. But we fought like dogs putting that book together because, as you know, he's very opinionated. I am too. And I right. said, Al, as a writer, you make a good umpire. <laughs> Well, the thing about Al is that, you know, he certainly had a varied background. I, I didn't realize until the other day, you know, he, he was umpire in that uh, San Francisco earthquake, the you know World Series when that happened, and, and I didn't realize that. But Al and I had talked a lot about baseball and the fact that we knew a lot of local people in the Trenton area, and that's where Al was from. Al Downing and I, have, we've had Al Downing on the broadcast with us, and Al and I grew up together. We played basketball and baseball against one another in the in the 50s so you know Al and I knew a lot of the same people but he was such a you know very outspoken as you're mentioning Dan uh, you know as an umpire and uh, you know I just was curious as to how you and and Al really worked on that book because I imagine as you said you did have some uh, some arguments from time to time being opinionated but how long did it take to put that book together Oh, it took about a year, but the, the thing was I would interview Al, so I have all the quotes word for word. I put it together in his voice, and then he wanted to edit his quotes to make himself look better. And I said, Al, the way you're reworking this, it's not conversational. It does not sound like anybody talking. It sounds like somebody writing, and you can't do that in this kind of a book. Well, obviously, my sentiments prevailed because that original hardcover book became a highly successful paperback book, too. Right. No, I know it is, and I think that's a, a key when you move from a hardback where you have some rather limited distribution cost-wise to go into a, a paperback. That, that's wonderful. Now, was that paperback, was that part of Nebraska, uh, University of Nebraska Press, or was that something yes. else? Yes. No, Nebraska did both. But the fun thing about the Al Clark book was all the stories and anecdotes that he remembers. Just, just incredible. Right. For example, did you know that he once threw his father out of a game? <laughs> no, I did not. I'd like to know. I'd like to know that story. Well, when you talk to Al, he doesn't readily give that up. But I spent a lot of time with him. I was down at his house in Williamsburg. He came up to my house in New Jersey. We spent a lot of time together. So he told me that one time he and his dad went to a game together. His dad, Herb Clark, whom I knew back in my right. AP Newark days. So right, it's a small world, really. But anyway, yeah, he is. and Herb yes. went to a game together from Trenton, from Ewing Township, went to a game, and Herb criticized, and after the game, Al was in the umpire's dressing room, and Herb came in there. Herb was a writer, as you mentioned, the Trenton Times. Herb right. came in there, and he criticized a call that went against the Yankees. Herb was a big-time Yankees fan, and Al <laughs> made a call that went against the Yankees. Well, that embarrassed Al, so he threw him out of the umpire's dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> and he forgot that Herb had the car keys. Anyway, Al told me it was the worst ride home he ever had from a game because his father disciplined him by talking like this all the way home. 
<laughs> That's a great story. I could just imagine that happening, knowing Al. I, I had never, I had never met Herb. I mean, I knew of Herb very well, and I have some articles that he wrote when my dad was playing. But you know, Al told me that was really how he got his interest uh, initially in baseball was because of you know his dad being a sports writer. But Al had a tremendous uh, umpiring career, and of course, at the end, it was it was difficult. But I th- I think he's come along and come back, and I know he's doing a lot of speaking and that kind of thing. And and Dan, I think you are too. Are, are, don't you do a lot of uh, appearances or did appearances and do some some speaking? I know you're in television. Of course, you're a big, I think, Atlanta Braves uh, guy too, right? I am a big Atlanta Braves guy, and I'm a little worried about this year because the three other contenders really beats themselves up while the Braves did not too much other than Josh Donaldson. But getting back to Al Clark for a second, you mentioned Al Downing. Al Downing right. wore number 24 when he was a pitcher in high school. That is right. the reason that Al Clark also took number 24. Oh, is that right? I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that either. Because Al's license plate, is, he's got a Virginia license plate, and it spells out 24 in Roman numerals. That was right. his number. And initially when I saw it, I said, Willie Mays, Ricky Henderson, what's this? Right. He said, no, Al Downing. I said, no, Al wore 44. So he said, not in high school he didn't. Yeah. Yeah, no, Al, Al and I, that's when I first met Al because he was pitching at Trenton High when I, he was a junior and we played basketball against one another as well as baseball. And, and we've been you know friends ever since. I mean, just a wonderful guy, a real gentleman and, and a tremendous uh, – you know, player in his own right, and of course, you know, people always talk about, well, yeah, he gave up uh, Hank Aaron's uh, 715. I said, yeah, that's true, but on the other hand, you know, Al never backed away from me. He said, yeah, he hit a good pitch, and uh, you know, somebody was somebody was going to be pitching. It just so happened it was me. So, uh, you know, I, I think that Al is. Uh, if you've if you've known Al, I mean, I've known him since we were kids, and and we just had him on our podcast oh, a couple months ago on the comfortably zoned radio network. So Al was a pleasure to, to be with. And I saw him a few times. He'd come back to Trenton, and he and I were on a baseball panel one time. And so, you know, he, he still comes back to Trenton quite a bit, as does Al. And it's funny, when you're talking about Al Clark, Dan, I had, a, I had a, somebody on Facebook, I think it was the other day, he said, did you know that Al Clark was the only umpire that had his name on a base on his hat, and I laughed. I said, "Yeah, it was Al." And I, Al all talked to me. He said, "Yeah, it's Al Clark, but everybody thinks it's my name, but it's really for American League." Yeah, and I also wanted to mention he once threw out Frank Robinson during the national anthem, and I said, <laughs> "How did you manage to do that?" He said, I had a rule. If you had an argument one day, the next day the slate was clean and you started fresh. So I was at home plate. Frank was managing the Indians. He came out with the lineup card, and he started arguing again from the previous day's argument. So I threw him out during the national anthem. I said, well, what happened after that? He said, the league fined us both, reprimanded us both. I said, Al, if you had to do it over again, what would you do? He said, I'd wait till the darn song ended. <laughs> Yeah, that's another great story, Dad. That really is. I hadn't heard that one before either. So I'm assuming that that's in your book. I haven't had a chance. I have the book. I just haven't had a chance to go through it. But, uh, but that you gotta, book came you out with it, George. There's so many yeah. stories. I mean, you mentioned a, a couple of games that he was in. But, I mean, right. there's so many of them. The Ripken tiebreaker game, he was an umpire. The Bucky Dent playoff game, he was there. Randy Johnson's right. 300th win. Nolan Ryan's. You know, I'm sorry, Randy Johnson's no hitter in Seattle. Nolan Ryan's 300th win. There were so many of these games that Al was involved in. When you, I guess, right. when you umpire for 26 years, you're going to have a lot of memorable games. Well, yeah, he did, and, and certainly, uh, you know, his, his long time, uh, you know, career as American League umpire. Now, when when the leagues all merged, I mean, I, I don't recall the timing of that. But was he still considered an American League umpire? Or was he just an umpire? That made, you know, major league umpire. He was both. He was still in the American League, but when the leagues merged, he obviously merged too, and he okay. got to manage. He got to umpire some National League games as well. And another okay. thing that I thought right. was really interesting about Al, as you know, I'm a Braves fan, and Bobby Cox, Bobby Cox holds a record with 158 ejections. So I said to Al, "How many times did you throw Bobby out of a game?" He said, "Never." I said, "Never? How could you not throw him out? He has a record." Al said. <laughs> Bobby and I were both old school. We respected each other. Right. 
I thought that was amazing. Well, he never threw Bobby out. Yeah, no, it is amazing. And, you know, talk about old school. I'm just curious as to, as your reaction on, on all these crazy uh, salaries and, and long-term contracts. What, what do you think about all that, uh, Dan? Well, as a traditionalist who grew up in the 50s, I really hate it. I liked when the players had one-year contracts and you got paid the following year for what you did the year before. That's how it should be. Right. I mean, a 10-year right. contract for Bryce Harper, is he really going to be that productive seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years from now? I doubt it. Well, you know, that's the way I feel. I have often said that. And uh, when my dad was playing, they all were governed by, you know, it was a different, you know, era, obviously. The the owners, you know, they with the reserve clause, they, they pretty much held the players captive. But on the other hand, uh, you know, players were paid, as you're saying, on their performance the previous year. And I don't, I don't begrudge players for getting as much as they can. I mean, the agents and free agency have certainly changed all that. But, you know, when I look at long-term contracts, 10, 13 years, or, or, you know, Bryce Harper said, you know, he might not even be playing 13 years from now. He's still going to be getting a, a big hunk of change. So it, 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 the whole, you know, area of, of long-term contracts in baseball and, and the amount of money is just, I mean, is, is just absolutely wild to me. I mean, if I were playing, I've said this before, I'd say, hey, where do I sign? I mean, if somebody's willing to offer you that kind of money, I mean, it's just a different world today. And the greed is appalling. The greed of the players, the greed of the agents. I mean, look at Craig Kimbrell and Dallas Keuchel. I mean, they're not signed yet because they want more money. Now, Craig Kimbrell right. turned down a $17.9 million qualifying offer from the Red Sox. He is not going to find anybody where he's going to have an annual average of $17.9 million a year. He, he just blew it. Yeah. Well, I think that's what's happened, Dan. I agree with you. I mean, I, I know that, well, Harper, I guess, was maybe the exception because, you know, he's offered $300 million from Washington, turns it down, and winds up getting $330 million from the Phillies. So, uh, you know, but on the other hand, I, I can see where guys, I mean, if, if they're trying to, you're talking about greed, I mean, that becomes a little bit outrageous to me when, when you look back at some of the greats of the game and what they were paid uh, and what, the, what a lot of guys today are being paid. I mean, the average fan, I think I saw a statistic just the other day in Philadelphia, Bryce Harper will make more money per at-bat than the average salary of uh, somebody in Philadelphia for a year. So, that's I mean, right. you're talking now, about greed. Like, to me, that's greed. Yeah. It's like $44,000, I think, was the figure I saw. Right. Yeah, that's the number I saw. Right. Yep. Now, Dan, let me ask you one, another thing about your, your book backgrounds. I do have a book, and you were gracious enough to send it to me, and, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about it, the, the 300 Club. And uh, you had a uh, on the cover, Have We Seen the Last of Baseball's 300 Game Winners? Uh, you had some people in there that certainly my dad played against or with, uh, with Feller and, and Lefty Grove. I mean, the fact that those, uh, Feller didn't make 300, but he could have, if, I think, uh, easily if he had been playing, but he took time out from World War II. But, you know, Early Wynn was a very close friend of my dad, a teammate, and Early just made 300. I think Lefty Grove made 300, so... Your your opinion, and I think I agree with you, because of the way the game has changed so much today, uh, you know, the fact is that you've got pitch counts and you've got the relievers and all that, that you probably are very rarely unlikely uh, if you're going to ever see a 300 winner, uh, game winner again. Yeah, very much so, George. In fact, if you look at history, Warren Spahn had 363 wins, but... He also had 382 complete games, more complete right. games than wins. Now nobody goes the whole game. They have so many relief pitchers, short men, long men, middle men. It's just crazy. And teams are spending so much money on their bullpens, they've got to use these guys. So the starters, right. Don Sutton told me starting pitcher was you know, trained to go nine innings when he was playing. But now, right. I mean, if they go five or six innings, they think that's a great job. It's, I think it's ridiculous. The game has really changed, and not for the better. Yeah, well, I agree with you that, again on that, uh, Dan. I mean, I know that they're talking about, you know, uh, what they call a so-called quality start. A quality start means, I guess, that the starting pitcher goes six innings. I mean, when, when uh, you know, earlier era in baseball, and you're talking about spawn, uh, you know, I also mentioned a lot of times Walter Johnson, the great Walter Johnson, the number of complete games he had, and comparing that with a guy who's pitching today, 
uh, I say today in 2019, CC Sabathia. I think Sabathia uh, has a total of like 37 complete games in his entire career. Yeah, that's really amazing. Sabathia also has the most wins of any active pitcher. Now, I'm not counting Bartolo Cohn because he is not an active pitcher. I'm sure that nobody is going to sign him. He is toast. He's done. He's right. ate his way out of baseball, not to mention his age. But Sabathia <laughs> is the leading winner, and he's not going to come close to 300, no matter what he does. Right, right. I know some of the 300, I mean, it used to be that was the plateau. I mean, everybody with milestone, they all wanted to get to there. And uh, early win, I know that he made, uh, what, five or six different efforts before he finally got there. He struggled through it. I mean, early was probably, what, in his 40s, I guess, and didn't really have any gas left in the tank. But the fact is that, you know, 300 was a tremendous milestone, a goal that he wanted to go after. And I think Lefty Grove is the same way. My my dad, you know, hit against Grove and, and said that Grove, when he was pitching in Boston, uh, you know, lefty was pretty much at the end of the line, and, and they, they could bunt against him because he had trouble getting off the mound. But, but that was a goal, you know, to get to 300 wins. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I agree with you today. I, I doubt seriously whether anybody's going to be even close to that. Well, with early win, one of his failed efforts at 300 – he finished on the wrong end of a one to nothing no hitter by Bill Mondoquette. <laughs> well, it's a little bit tough if you're if you're being pitched again. A guy gets a no no on you, and, and you know uh, that's a that's a heck of an accomplishment. I didn't realize that, Dan, and and I'm sure that early uh, you know was not real happy with it. But on the other hand, he he persevered and stayed in there until he could get that 300th win. Yeah, he did, and that's it's remarkable that any pitcher could win that many games. And if you look at the list, there are only 24 pitchers in baseball history who have won as many as 300 games. But a couple of guys, Warren Spahn with his 363, he, like Feller, had a lot of time in the service during World War II. He could have won 400 games. And right. maybe, maybe if Phil Negro had been with better ball clubs, he might have done it too. Well, yeah, I, I think you're probably right there with, with, with regard to Necro. I mean, knuckleballers and that kind of stuff, I mean, they certainly, uh, you know, are, are going to hang in there. And, and a lot of pitchers, I think early Wynn developed a knuckleball toward the end of his career, too, and that, that kept him going. And, and that, that's, a, that's a tough pitch. If guys are throwing, uh, you know, 98 or 100 miles an hour, whatever they're reputed to do, I think eventually they're only going to have so many, you know, pitches in their arm. But a guy with a knuckleball or, or somebody who recovers, you know, is able to change speeds or location or you know that kind of thing with like a Whitey Ford or Bobby Chance. They're gonna they're gonna hang in there. Um, so I, I I think you're absolutely right as far as the the pitching is concerned. Now, you know, when it comes to Spawn, I mean, Spawn definitely was a throwback. I mean, Warren was in World War II, was a decorated combat veteran, came back, you know, wound up with what a 400 or whatever 300 and some 400 wins. In a, in a long career, right, and and that's so rare today that somebody would be able to avoid all the arm injuries, and yet you know Warren was able to do that, and uh, even a Nolan Ryan. I mean, we talked about Ryan. I mean, great fastball pitcher, but you know Nolan, to my knowledge, has, has really said, you know, he was not in favor of pitch counts. He thinks pitchers should pitch, and that's how they strengthen. And I think Dan, you probably were talking in, in your book to, about some pitchers, and that's, that was their philosophy as well. You know, you're supposed to pitch, and you're going to get stronger with your arm if you pitch. If you're only going to gear yourself for six innings, you know, that, that's, a, that's a different animal. Yeah, I totally agree with that. It was just amazing what the old guys did. And Spahn, by the way, had the most wins of any pitcher post-World War II, all 363 post-World War II. Wow. I mean that, that's uh, that's incredible. And now now the other thing too, and you know this is away from pitching, but pitchers traditionally, you know, people say, well, pitchers don't hit, but but some guys were very good hitters. I mean, Spawn was one of them. Uh, Spawn you know, Homer, by the way, Spawn Homer, seventeen years in a row, an incredible performance. Wow. It is. 
And I don't think he'd have been real happy with, you know, I think eventually the National League is going to come up with a DH. I think they probably are going not. to have to. But Hope not. I, I don't either. I don't like the – Dan, I do yeah. not like the DH, never liked it. Uh, I always, you know, think the pitcher should hit. And if they – if you know, Wes Farrell. Wes Farrell was one of the great hitters. And Red Ruffin, I mean, they were terrific guys with the bat. They weren't an automatic out. And I've always maintained that uh, if a pitcher you – know, if he can't help himself with the bat – as far as you know, getting a hit or whatever. If you got a guy and you got a, in a situation, you have to move up a runner. You know, learn how to bunt. And as you right. know, I'm sure as a cute observer of baseball, and I watch it, it makes myself sick. I said, very few guys know how to bunt today. That's true. And I think the pitcher can hit. Who can hit? Should have that advantage over his opponent. Look at Don Newcomb, Don Drysdale. There's so many of them right, right down the line. Rick Roden. When he was with the Yankees, was actually used as a DH by Billy Martin. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. I, I know some of them. I know some of them would pinch hit. I, I know that for a fact. But you know, I just think that uh, you know, I guess the way it is today, the American League they open the door, and I think the National National League is going to follow. I just don't like the fact that you now have, you know, the highest level of baseball. You got two different rules, and uh, I, I, anyway, I for one, I... yeah. I was going to mention a great trivia question. What player who played at least 500 games has the highest lifetime batting average? <laughs> I don't know. Who, who would that be? The answer is Terry Forster, who was a relief pitcher. He made right. more than 500 appearances. His lifetime batting average was 397. Wow. That's amazing. I, I do know I, I did not know that. I do know that some guys had some very good batting averages. I mean, uh, you know, Wes Farrell was one I mentioned him before. I mean, he was a terrific hitter. I mean, Wes and, and his brother Rick. I mean, they formed a battery with with Washington. I think also in Boston. But but Rick had such a volatile temper. I think that really kept him out of out of a lot of games and certainly out of the Hall of Fame. But but he was an outstanding hitting pitcher. And, and as you know, covering, uh, you know, New York baseball, Red Ruffing was a terrific hitter as well. Yes, he was. And the wrong Farrell is in the Hall of Fame, by the way. It should be Wes, but actually it's Rick. Yeah. I not know. not belong in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's what a lot of people say, Dan. You know, I mean, Rick got his, uh, you know, his expertise as far as you know, being able to handle the knuckleball and that kind of thing. But, but West was an outstanding. Actually, West was an outstanding pitcher. Won a lot of twenty, had a lot of twenty games, you know, uh, years, and, and was terrific. But uh, again, as I said, you know, his temper was just terrible. I mean, he used to rip up clubhouses and dugouts and all kinds of stuff, you know, very similar to the way Lefty Grove, but, but Lefty Grove was able to hang in there. But Wes, I think, uh, short-circuited his career by, you know, his, his attitude. Yeah, a lot of guys have that problem. So you just have to suck it in and do your best and cope. Right. Uh, Dan, let me ask you this before we close. I mean, we've been on here talking on uh, Comfortably the Zone Radio Network, and I really appreciate you being on with us. But uh, what are your what are your plans in the future? Are you working on a, on a new book, or, or what are you doing at at the present time? Well, on May seventh, the first paperback edition of When the Braves Ruled the Diamond will be coming out, and it's been updated to include all the Hall of Fame stuff. There have been six Braves within a five-year span, who got to the Hall of Fame, and that includes John Turholtz and Bobby Cox, and quotes from their inductions and stuff like that, that's all included, and information about Braves that should be Hall of Famers, in my opinion, Fred McGriff, Gary Sheffield, Andrew Jones, that's all in the book, too. So May 7th, when the Braves ruled the diamond, 14 flags over Atlanta will be out in paperback for the first time. And a year from now, 2020, the new baseball Bible will be – updated again with a new title. This was originally the baseball catalog going way back to 1980 when it was a Book of the Month Club book. So that book will be coming out again from sports publishing in the spring of 2020. Well, that's that's wonderful. Now, Dan, do you do you have a website or anything that, that you could tell us on the air where, where people, if they're really interested in your books, you know, where they could either get them or, or buy them, you know, locally, wherever they're, you know, situated? But I, I'd be curious to know, do you have a – I looked up your career, so I got some notes on it, but I think it would be, uh, you know, really well – uh, intention for people to know that you have a website and, and your books, your many books are available for them. 
Yes, I do have a website, and it's danschlossberg.net. And I'll spell that for your listeners. It's D-A-N. Then it's S-C-H-L-O-S-S-B-E-R-G, danschlossberg.net. And all the information is on there. And by the way, I just wanted to mention, George, two upcoming appearances. One in Florida at Reunion Resort, and that is going to be on March 23rd, March 23rd, from 5 to 7 p.m. at Reunion Resort. I'm going to be giving a PowerPoint presentation on the New Baseball Bible and then signing the New Baseball Bible and when the Braves rule the diamond. That's March 23rd in Florida at Reunion Resort, and that follows the very last game by the Braves at Disney World. After that, they're moving to their new place in Northport, Florida. So that follows the last game at Disney World. And again, on April 9th, I'll be speaking at the Fort Lee, New Jersey Public Library. Well, now, Dan, let me ask you this: are, are you still are you still up in North Jersey? You mentioned Fort Lee. Are you up in North Jersey now, where you live? Yes, yes I'm in Fairlawn, okay. New Jersey. You're in Saraville, okay? All right. Fairlawn. Well, I went Fairlawn. to Rutgers, so I'm I'm very familiar with the Saraville area and no, 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 you know, no, the whole I'm, I'm area from, up there. So. I'm from Ron Parnosky's hometown, Fairlawn, New Jersey. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well, Dan, thank you again. I really appreciate it, and, and, and good luck with all your books. And uh, uh, the, the appearances, I mean, I think are going to be wonderful. If some of the, you know, our podcast listeners are, are made a note of those, those various dates, I think it's, it's great. And, and to be part of the Comfortably Zone radio network uh, we're on here, and uh, I know that you were on, a, I guess, an earlier time with, with Ralph Tycho, and, and Ralph called me about a year ago and asked me to be involved because of my baseball background, and it's a pleasure for me to, to be able to talk with people like yourself. So, again, I wanted to wish you well, and, and, and thank you very much for spending some time with us. My pleasure, George. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye now, everybody. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.